of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Those are the words of George Washington, the first president of the United States, in his farewell address in 1796 as he was about to leave office. And he makes a very keen and astute observation that for political prosperity, that is for nations to continue to exist and survive and even thrive in this world, there are two indispensable supports, religion and morality. It seems in our modern times that many leaders have forgotten the place of religion and morality in the undergirding of our society. Civilizations throughout ancient history have risen to prominence and fallen because of their moral decay. It happened to the Assyrians. It happened to the Babylonians. It happened to the Persians. It even happened to the Israelites, who were those that were chosen by God specifically to be the nation by which the seed would come to fruition. They had forgotten their moors back to God, the ties that held them bound as a nation and as a people. I remember God speaking of them and how he created them as Jeshurun, as the beautiful one, perfect and pristine without sin and with the perfect direction to keep them that way in God's sight. But then how he lamented how she played the harlot and went whoring after the false idols and eventually fell from the grace which he supplied for them. Their religion and their morality had decayed and as a result, the nation was close behind. George Washington would later say in the same speech, let it be asked, where is the security for prosperity, for reputation, for life? If the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths, which are the instruments of an in investigation in the courts of justice, what, if, if we forget that what we are searching for in, in justice in American courts is the truth, is the righteousness, it is the, the security, if we forget our religious oaths, our promises of righteousness, and morality, where is the justice going to come from? The second president of the United States, John Adams, in writing a letter to his friend Benjamin Rush, who was a member of the ministry, he said, I agree with you in sentiment that the religion and virtue are the only foundations, not only of republicanism and of all free government, but of social felicity under all governments. What is going to bind us together? What's going to pull us together? What's going to hold us together? Ultimately, he says, it is our religion and virtue, that moral foundation. People have known and recognized this for thousands of years. The founding fathers of our nation understood the vital link between national survival and religious morality. If the morals decay, the country will, will, will crumble with it into oblivion. John Adams even observed talking about ancient Rome and how it finally defeated its last great enemy in Carthage. He said, which we should or should think would have established it as a supreme dominion. But by removing all danger, it suffered into debauchery, and it made it at length an easy prey for the barbar barbarians. In other words, when Rome removed its final enemy, the people were at peace, and they just started to do whatever they wanted willy-nilly. And the society as a whole lost its moral f uh, footing, and it, and it fell into debauchery and sin and iniquity, and it made Rome ripe for the plucking by those around it. Without a moral underpinning, nations fall. Consider for just a second our own democracy. I realize it is a representative republic, but we, we often refer to it as a, a democracy, the concept of majority rules. But if you put that into practice without a moral foundation, all of a sudden we can vote to legalize theft and stealing. 
if the majority rules and the majority decides that what my neighbor has, if I have the power to take it, I can have it. What's to stop us from doing that? A morality that undergirds even the foundations of our legal system. If, if there is no morality, we can have the majority rule and say, you know what, if someone, if someone looks at you funny, it's okay to kill them. Murder. Murder is okay. There is no punishment. What is to keep us from voting that in as law? That moral foundation that undergirds all free governments. We could, we could legalize any crime we wanted if majority rules. You see, without religion and morality, democracy does not work. Without religion and morality, freedom and liberty simply does not work. But where does that morality arise? It comes from the church. A couple of weeks ago, we started this, this series, If the Foundations be, Are Destroyed, What Then Can the Righteous Do? From Psalm 11 and verse 3. <coughs> David, David is, is faced with his enemy and his, his generals are saying the best thing you can do is flee as a bird to your mountain. And David says, why would you tell me flee as a bird to my mountain? If these foundations are destroyed, what then can the righteous do? We have got to stand for God and undergird the foundations so that they do not crumble. The church is one of those foundations. We saw a couple weeks ago that the family as the building block of society, the, the smallest building block that God uses to create civilizations and society. Whenever it is destroyed or if it is crumbled, then, then the, the civilization itself is not far behind. But along with the family, another of the foundations is the church, the religious and moral underpinning that are required for all nations to survive. Morality isn't just a shot in the dark. It's the expression of uh, or it is the express declaration of God. God would say in Isaiah 5, 45, verse 19, I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. God is not just thumping his chest toward the people. He's, he, he's saying, for you to have gone away into sin the way that you have, do you think that I've spoken in secret and not told you what to do? Well, of course not, God. God sent Moses down the mountain with the stone tablets. They saw the law, and, 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 and it was reified in the stones itself. They saw it. They heard Moses preach it. They heard the prophets remind them over and over and over again. God's law was not secret. He didn't hold his cards close to his chest, but rather he, he told them expressly what he wanted. He said, I did not say to the, the, the house of Jacob, seek me in vain. He said, there is always eternal life and reward attached to obeying God. You knew what to do and you knew what the result was if you did or did not do those things. I, the Lord, speak the truth. Everything that God has spoken is truth. Everything that is truth is truth because God spoke it. They are one and the same. We cannot separate the message of God from truth because it is truth. He says, I declare what is right how we are to live. Religion and morality that George Washington saw as the underpinnings, as the vital support for a republic society or a democratic society or a free society, the moral and religion comes from God. He declares what is right. And he told us long ago, I'm going to send a lawgiver to you. Notice he spoke these words after Moses had already brought them the old law. He says, uh, uh, actually just before that in Genesis 49, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall all the obedience of the, be all the obedience of the people. Genesis 49 and verse 10. In Micah, God turned his attention to the city of Bethlehem to tell them that, that in Bethlehem was going to come this lawgiver. He says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth to me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming, now notice this, and the, the tense of the verbs that he uses, whose coming forth is from of old. In other words, God says, I have already set in his motion his coming forth from long ago, and there's going to come a day when that man is going to come and arise from the city of Bethlehem, though he was even too small to be of the tribes of Judah, he was a tiny, tiny clan within the tribes of Judah, he says, but, but you, from you, from your seed was going to come the one, the ruler. God foretold this lawgiver was going to come to Jerusalem. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up into the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall the law, go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah 4 and verse 2. Over and over and over we see God telling the people there is going to come a time of peace and prosperity and righteousness. And that time came with Jesus Christ when he came to this earth. He came as the lawgiver, establisher of righteousness and morality of the highest degree. And he put that morality in his church. For this purpose I was born, Jesus would say, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness of the truth. God said, I speak the truth. Jesus, I came to speak, bear witness of that truth and to give it to you. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. John 18 and verse 37. He is the word who was in the beginning, who was with God, who is God. John 1, 1 through 3. That word is God's declaration of righteousness to the world. The church is the leading light. Let me take that back. The church is the only light of righteousness and morality in a world that is darkened with sin. Salvation is in that church. Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No, no one comes unto the Father except by me. He becomes the only source of salvation. There is salvation in nowhere else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4 and verse 12. He is the only way. There's a rather lengthy paragraph in Hebrews chapter 12, 2 beginning in verse 1. Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard. What have we heard? We have heard the morality which God has given to us, the truth and the righteousness he wants us to live by. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just recompense or retribution, under the old law that was delivered by the angels to Moses, Everything that you did, contrary to the will of God, received a just retribution. If that is true, which it was, he asked the question, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If we, of the church, neglect the salvation that God has given to us, if we today in the last days Neglect the salvation that God has given. How shall we escape that just retribution? And the answer is, we cannot. It is a rhetorical question. We cannot escape it if we reject it. It was declared at first by the Lord. And it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. God wanted to make sure we understood and knew that his righteousness has come to this earth and it is in his church. But just as we recognize the church as the standard of morality in our modern age, we also know that the church is under attack. There are those who are seeking the demise of the church, being guided by the, by the devil himself. 
Satan's attacks come in the form of many forms, like sectarianism, the idea of division. Those who are saying, well, we're all going to the same place. We're just going different ways. We're traveling different roads. Jesus said, I am the way. There are not many ways under the Father. The word translated way there is the Greek hodos, where we get the word ex hodos, meaning the road out. And it's the word road or highway or way. Jesus says, I am the highway to God. I am the way to God. No one comes to the Father except traveling this road. Are there many roads leading to the Father? No. There's one. But sectarianism tries to convince us that, that there are many. They are neglecting Jesus' prayer for unity in John 17, verses 20 and 21, that they may be one Father as you are in me. They are rejecting Paul's plan for unity. Here's how you have unity. You speak the same thing, be of the same mind and the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. And they're dejecting our plea for unity, that we today continue to reach out to a world that is lost in sin with the same gospel, with the same plan, the same grace, and ultimately the same life that was given to us, that was given to the apostles in the first century that was brought by Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And yet sectarianism tries to say, well, it doesn't make a difference. One man came to my office once and told me that we need to set aside our differences because they don't matter. And I was highly offended because to me that sounded like the blood of Christ doesn't matter. Let's ignore it. Because it was the blood of Christ that purchased the very doctrine and righteousness that we know today. The church is under attack, not just from sectarianism, but from secularism and humanism, saying that there is nothing supernatural, that what you see is what you get. It is the here and now and nothing beyond. They explain the world through their natural senses. They're quick to say, well, you know, you can believe in your God, but here's how we know that these things happen, the sun rising and the sun setting and the universe and everything spinning whirly, twirly, out of control. To theorize, though, about irrational and unnatural things that they cannot explain. They have, to, they have to turn off those laws, ignore what they have proven and say, but in this moment, the very beginning, a spark of, of, of life, the big bang or whatever it was, we have to theorize about because it cannot be proven and it goes against all that we already know. The problem isn't with our knowledge of science. The problem isn't with what we theorize. The problem is that too many people take God out of the equation and try to explain the rest with everything they have. You would almost want to describe it as a 500-piece puzzle that you've been working on for three years. And over the course of that time, you've lost a piece. And when you've got everything ready, and you're ready to put that last piece in, it's not there. But it's not quite like that. It's like having one piece of a 100-piece puzzle <laughs> and looking at it for three years and wondering, how can I solve this problem? Because you have taken away the majority of the power of the universe by ignoring God. Pluralism tells us everyone's opinion is okay. What's true for you may not be for me. If it's right for you, you do that. If this is right for me, I'll do this, and we'll both be okay. You be angry and sin not, I'll be angry and sin, and we'll be okay. You withhold your hand for murder, I'll murder. It's okay. They're both right. They can't both be right. Pluralism tries to tell us that something can be both X and not X at the same time. It can both be right and wrong at the same time but it can't be. And they're attacking the church that way. Well, well, if you think Jesus is the only way, that's good for you. But for me, my God is bigger than that. Jesus may be the only way for you, but I see truth in many religions. The patronizing, the condescension, 
To speak those words in such a way as to ignore what the truth is that Jesus is the only way. We live in a world that is preoccupied with materialism and that is attacking the church as it infiltrates the church and it changes the focus of our work and our worship to material things. Atheism, we, we talk about the, the religion that there is no God. It's, it's attacking the church. The, the fact that the church is being attacked, the evidence is all around us. And it's not in red coffee cups from Starbucks. That was stupid. It is from political leaders who equate the value of Islam and terrorism with Christianity. That's offensive. And that's an attack on the church. It is the devaluing of Christian morals that undergird our national foundation. It is the ridicule of the Bible from so-called Christian leaders and political leaders. When the only time Christ is considered in our political society today, it seems, is whenever it's going to culture good political theater. But if these foundations are destroyed, if the devil is successful in these attacks on the church and on the family, if these foundations are destroyed, what then can the righteous do? You and me here today, what can we do? What does God speak to us? I, I, I think we have to remember our place. Philippians 3 and verse 20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. And we've got to remember that first and foremost. My citizenship is not the United States of America. It's not even this earth. My true citizenship is in heaven. I belong to the kingdom of God first and foremost. And that's what prompted Peter and John to say, whether we should listen to you rather than God, you judge for yourselves. But for as for us, we can only speak that which we have seen and heard. In Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 5, he says uh, uh, that, that we have to obey God rather than men. Why? Because our citizenship is in heaven with God. And it wasn't spoken in a condescending way. I think Peter and John are speaking this, telling them that our citizenship is for the Father, and yours can be too. We all have an opportunity to stand with God in wholeness. And so we remember that our citizenship is in heaven first and foremost. But we also have to remember, number two, that we live on this earth. And we have to live our lives of faith openly and obviously to those around us. We, as we saw this morning in our, our class on the Sermon on the Mount, we're not called to blend into the background. We are called to stand out. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. A light on a hill cannot be hid. It's not put under a bushel basket. The Christian is not hidden. He's not called to blend into the background. He is called to stand out from the world that everyone may know that here is a Christian. And if, if the foundations of our society crumble around us, we live our faith openly. If the United States of America or the Western civilization crumbles into the ash heap of history, our faith will live for an eternity. Amen. Number three, we have to embrace our place as being counterculture. You know, a lot of times people talk of counterculture today. Uh, counterculture, you know, guys that walk around with tattoos up and down their arms, that's, that's counterculture. People who listen to uh, certain kinds of, of, of music, you know, that's, that's counterculture. The idea is that the culture is going one way and that they are, are going against the stream. Here's counterculture. Living Christ in the modern world. That's counterculture. It's not about tattoos. It's not about the music you listen to. It's about the faith that you have. We are called to stand out and not blend in. Number four, let us be one of the ten. Think about it. In Genesis 18, verses 22 through 30, where, where, where Moses is, is 
reasoning with God. God, if we can find 50 righteous people in Sodom, would you save the city? God, yeah, I'd do it for 50. Well, would you do it for 45? Yes, I'd do it for 45. Would you save the city of God or Sodom for 40 people? 30? 20? He gets God down to 10. God, if we can find 10 righteous people, would you save Sodom? Yes. It's one of the saddest commentaries on any society that you couldn't find 10 righteous people in Sodom. Lot and his two daughters were saved. His wife could have been saved, almost was, but she looked back longing for the things of Sodom instead of the things that, of righteousness. But other than those three, they couldn't find seven more people to save the city of Sodom. We are living in the city of Sodom in this world. As it continues, it's, it's not walk, but it, it's hard run. It's sprint into devilishness and carnality and immorality as we see the world separating itself further and further and further away from God. We are living in Sodom. And I may be one of the righteous ten that saves it. I must be ready to suffer persecution and not, not try to avoid it by toning down the rhetoric. Christians who believe that Jesus is the only way, well, don't go around telling people that. You're going to offend the Muslim. Don't tell people that. You're going to, you're going to offend uh, uh, the Buddhist. You're going to offend all these other people if you tell them that, that Christ is the only way. You're going to offend people of the denominations if you tell them that Jesus' way is the only way and that we can't just pretend we're all Christians and get along. You're going to offend people. Tone it down. Paul said something similar, only it went like this. All who live godly in this present world will suffer persecution. Paul said it this way. Speak boldly the truth of God. Doesn't sound like tone it down, does it? We must be ready to suffer persecution. We have got to draw up in battle array. Never forget that we are called to fight against not flesh and blood, Ephesians, or Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 11, but we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil against the principalities, against the powers of, the, of, the, of darkness and, and spiritual or high places. That's what we fight against. Paul told Timothy, I charge, or this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18. The end of that very same letter, he says, Fight the good fight of the faith and take hold of eternal life, 1 Timothy 6, 12. And 2 Timothy, he writes to him again in chapter 2, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We are spiritual warriors. And we must be willing to fight that battle. What then can the righteous do? We can sound the alarm. What's the alarm? The foundations are under attack. The enemy is here. In Ezekiel 3 and verse 18, God told Ezekiel, If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. Why are they going to die? Because of their, and their sin and their wickedness. He says, if I tell them you surely are going to die, but... But you do not give them a warning or speak to warn them from the wicked and from their wicked ways. In order to save his life, that wicked person shall die, God said, for his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hands. Ezekiel 3.18. He said the same thing in Ezekiel 3.20. The same basic idea. He repeats it at the end of the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 33, his blood I require at your hands. Why? Because you did not sound the alarm. What then can the righteous do? We've got to sound the alarm. America's foundations have been shaken. The church and the family have been targeted. 
And if the devil is, continues his successful run, our nation and its freedoms will be destroyed. But God's long-suffering now holds back. God's mercy is waiting for our iniquity to grow, maybe. But I'd like to think he is waiting for the church to come alive, for the giant to awaken, to challenge our society to be greater, to be the greatness, experience the greatness that God wants us to have. The devil is not going to grow a conscience anytime soon and give up his attack. He's not going to say, oh, you know what? I'm going against God and we'll stop. The devil's not going to do that. The carnal will not suddenly discover the spiritual way and follow it by accident. The sectarian is not going to begin to understand that his decisive spirit is against Christ. Those things are not going to happen. What's going to happen is when those who are allied with God will be able to hold back the reins and stop our national slouch toward Gomorrah. And it all begins with me. It all begins with my determination to come to God, to give up self, to give up sin, and to embrace the salvation and compassion and mercy of a creator who created me in a way to know me, and he beckons to me, come to me. It begins right here. What are we doing? Most importantly, this morning, the question comes, what are you doing? What is Sam doing? These are questions that we as individuals have to ask. Am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution? We're still part of the problem if we've never obeyed the gospel. The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back with his angels and in flaming fire he's going to take vengeance on those that do not know God and have not obeyed the gospel. Two groups of people. And if I'm one of those that does not know God, I'm not intimately associated with his commands and his will... And if I have not put myself to obey those things, then I will be lost. I will receive the, the flaming fire of Jesus. I'm part of the problem if I'm in that group. So I want to make sure that I come to know God. I know God by knowing the righteousness He's real, revealed in His Word. I read it, I study it, I know the Bible. But knowing the Bible is not enough. I've got to actually obey it. Obey the gospel. Being baptized for the remission of my sins, I experience the death, the burial, and the resurrection, which 1 Corinthians 15 tells me is the core facts of the gospel. This is it. In death and burial and resurrection and baptism, I am, I am saved by the grace of God. Not, not because there's anything special about the water or holy about the water, but because I have I've submitted to the will of God. I've given up myself and my control, and I've turned it over to God to allow Him to take control. If I've done that, then I'm part of the solution. If I've done that and I've gone back to the ways of the world, I'm still part of the problem. But if I come to him this morning in repentance and seek his forgiveness, I'm part of the solution. And as long as I, in humility, am willing to recognize my sin and know where to go, God, for salvation, we can help halt the deterioration of society as we know it. This morning, if you're not a part of the solution, you're still part of the problem, own up to that. Make a change in your life. Come to Him this morning in submission and become His child. Repent of your sins. Come back into fellowship with a God who loves you. Be part of the solution while we stand and while we sing. Jesus.